Hey, I'm Daniel, and welcome to another episode of the Film Crazier Show. This episode is a bit different from my usual episodes, as I was able to talk with some of the minds behind the upcoming film, The Mire, which is currently in the crowdfunding phase. I spoke with the film's director, Adam Nelson, the film's screenwriter, Chris Watt, and the film's producer, Tom Byrne. Though, as my comfort zone is talking about films that I've already seen, we start by talking about a segment called Toilet Humor from an anthology film that Adam and Tom worked on. So Adam starts out with a pretty funny story about what inspired that segment in that film. Then, then we touch on the crowdfunding where we talk about how Chris came on the project, the research involved, as well as the perks of the crowdfunding campaign, like Chris writing people monologues. The, the crowdfunding campaign is being held on greenlit.com and you can find info for it directly below. And hopefully something in this interview will intrigue you enough to help out with the campaign and support indie film. So here's Adam to introduce himself and get this podcast started. Uh, I'm Adam Nelson. I'm a director from Portsmouth and you're watching the film Craziest Show. Hi, I'm Chris Watt. I'm a screenwriter from the Northeast of Scotland and you're watching the film Craziest Show. Hi. I'm Tom. I'm a producer, director based in London, and you're watching the Film Craziest Show. Glad to have everybody here to chat about uh, toilet humor and as well as the crowdfunding for the Mire. Yeah, it's great to be here. Cool. Thank you. Now, I'd love to start with the short, the short film within an anthology film, Toilet Humor. Can can you just talk about Adam how you got approached for that and how you got in an anthology movie? Um. Yeah, I, I originally uh, had the idea for Toilet Humour before it became a part of the I Am An Addict anthology. Um, it was a short film that I wrote that I was planning to make um, based on a particularly peculiar incident I had in a toilet at a train station. Um, I, I'm, I don't like public toilets. I find them uncomfortable um, places. I don't like it. But one day I was coming back from a trip into Portsmouth city center um, and I was coming out via train and I, I had to go. Uh, there was, there was no stopping it. The wheels were in motion, so to speak. And um, so I went into the toilet and all of a sudden I hear someone come running in, slams the door to the cubicle beside me. And then I don't know what was up, but it sounded like he was having a fight with something or someone in in the toilet <laughs> and it was both incredibly funny but also quite unnerving because all of a sudden he just went deadly quiet and then that was it and I, I left and he was still in there and you know I don't know what happened after that <laughs> and then I was just sat on the train home and it's only like a 15 minute sort of journey from Portsmouth city centre to the town where I live but in that 15 minutes, I had like the idea for what became Toilet Humour. Originally, it was just going to be the segment in the toilet. It was going to be in the nastiest public toilet in Portsmouth City Centre, um, which is under our, which is just by our Guildhall and Civic offices. But that didn't pan out. But I had that kind of idea just in the 15-minute train journey home. And I thought, oh, that could be quite an interesting sort of short film you know, it starts quite sharply it ends quite sharply and more importantly because of the nature of it taking place in the toilet and I knew that I wouldn't have enough like money to show the monster that I was planning to have in it it could also be quite funny so we um so I just made it funny and that's how it kind of came about and I was trying to get it made and that's when I first met Tom and we sort of talked about it and at that point we weren't kind of ready for it to, to happen. And then about a year later, I met Rob, who was the producer of I Am An Addict. And he was looking for short film ideas that would fit in his anthology about uh, addiction and such. And I said, I've got something that could be changed into someone being addicted to food quite easily. Um, and he was like, yeah, you know, let's chat. And we had to talk about it. And then I redrafted the script. Um, and it became the film that's in I Am An Addict. And I brought Tom on board. And uh, yeah, we, that's, that's how that sort of came to life, as it were. It was just through kind of like pure chance that the one time I use a public toilet, 
something weird happened whilst I was in there. Okay, so, so you were kind of like you kind of imagined what was happening during that silence, where he was he was probably mortified by the sounds he was making. Right? Yeah, that, it was it was just kind of like I, I, it, he went really silent, and just as he went silent, that was when I stood up, and he must have heard that, and he must have realized there was someone in there with him because after that he was just like deadly deadly silent. These are um, the sort of anecdotes that you simply do not get on Inside the Actor's Studio, uh, aren't they? I mean, you wouldn't <laughs> see Sam Mendes discussing <laughs> the origin of his latest movie in that way. That's it's a very it's, British sensibility. But it's also like kind of... I don't do horror very often because um, it's got... I think that if I'm going to write horror or do horror, it has to be something that I'm afraid of. And I'm afraid... Well, I'm not afraid, but I don't like public toilets. They do make me uncomfortable. I'm a, I'm a deeply private person in reality. And okay. so anything kind of like that makes me somewhat uncomfortable unless I've had a bit to drink. Um, and then I'm also kind of like, I don't like the idea of parasites and tapeworms and things like that. So the two just kind of came together. And I love the film Alien. And this is kind of like, like half a love letter to Alien as well, because it's very similar in that respect. So not a okay. chest burster, but a... A butt burster. <laughs> yeah, I got, I might have gotten little Dreamcatcher vibes there when he tries yeah. to oh, shut yeah, the yeah. toilet. Yeah, it, I, I, I realised that a little bit. Like, I have seen Dreamcatcher, but, um, and I've read the book, but it's, in my opinion, it's one of King's kind of lesser works, so I don't remember it very well. And then someone mentioned that it was a bit like Dreamcatcher, and I was like, oh, yeah, we won't talk about that for legal reasons, because uh, <laughs> it's very similar to Dreamcatcher in the end. But, but yeah, um, it is, I was thinking more alien when I, ha when I had the idea. But <clears throat> okay. also, just like the idea is, is, is kind of, it's funny. If, I don't think uh, you could write something about someone or a monster coming out of someone's butt and it not be funny. Like, you've got to play up to the humour of that situation. You can't play it 100% straight. Um, and then when we made it, we were very lucky. The, the guy who played the person with the parasite is naturally very light and funny anyway. So he really went for it when he was performing and he really brings it all the way, I think. There's a lot of gross out humour in it. We were on set and there's this, um, a shot where Finn, the actor, he's just downing a bottle of Fanta. And this is a two litre bottle. Um, and I'm not sure how it was in the script or what the direction was, but it was generally the kind of thing where we're all on set wondering, wait, where is all that Fanta going right now? We had to cut that, the first take of that, because I, I couldn't hold it. I had to laugh because it's... What he, what he was doing was he was blocking it with his tongue and just making the noise with his throat. And it was so exaggerated. It was just, oh, 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 oh. And I, we had to cut it because it, I, I couldn't hold it. I couldn't control myself. Uh, you guys put that in post. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny to know he was actually making that noise. Yeah, yeah, he really... Uh, every, all the sound in that is, um, is on-set sound. We didn't do a lot of Foley for it. The monster sounds and the fart sounds are, are foley, but okay. the drinking and such is all is all him. I was gonna say even the gurgling. <laughs> uh, yeah, all of that's foley. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, all the all the sounds that like it, all that sound was him. That was all all him. Okay. Now I know that you, Tom and Adam, you guys are also office workers in the film. Yeah. Yeah. We've got small roles. Okay, it's, what was uh, that like? On our IMDb pages forever now, Office Worker 3. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, you're number three. Tom, which one were you? Oh, crap, I'm not number three. Must be number oh, you were, number, you were number three. I'm going to say I'm number one just for okay. <laughs> clout. Um, yeah, I'm not very comfortable usually on camera. It's the sort of thing I'll get a muck in if it needs to be done. And it was just a case of giving a bit of um, action to a wider shot. So we were just sat and chatting, weren't we, Adam? Nothing too yeah. strenuous. I think we were talking about your coffee cup. It was an interesting coffee cup. Yeah, it was um, because we we needed to give like a sense that the we shot it on a Sunday, so the office was empty. Um, so we we needed to give a sense that there were other people in this office, 
even if there's no other people around those two because the space where um, the Josh character sits is disgusting. So True. we, um, so yeah, we, in the wider shots, um, Tom and uh, Shannon sat in the back for one of the wider ones and then I joined them for a, a later shot um, just because I've always fancied having the occasional like cameo in something that I do. Okay. Okay. Okay, Nate. All right. Cool. Now, getting getting into the wire, or at least my transition question, I think, I don't know if you mind me bringing our Twitter conversation into the, the chat, Adam, but I, I you had mentioned something about like how you don't work with the same team so much and you like to branch out a lot. And I just, I thought that was interesting because I've heard success in working with the same teams and then also branching out. So curious if you could talk to that. Yeah, it, it's... It's a, mi- it's a mixed thing, really. I, I don't have a film school background, and I went to film school. Um, I did film studies, which is all theoretical. Okay. And so I went into teaching film studies, because really, when I left university, all I wanted was a job where I got to talk about film. Um, and then for a variety of reasons, I got kind of shunted to the left and told, you know, if you want to keep your job, you have to teach filmmaking as well as film studies. Um, so I wound up teaching filmmaking and because I didn't really know what I was doing, like I was just, I'll wing it because I don't want to lose my job. Um, I had to learn how to do all the filmmaking stuff kind of as I went. Um, you can help a lot of teaching people how to put films together by watching lots of films and knowing what films are, but I still had to know um, the technical stuff. Um, I'm quite fortunate. My, my mum's a photographer, so I knew bits about that already and I'd had a fun editing when I was at college and little bits of practical work I did at uni so I knew the rudimentary stuff and then um, yeah that just like the more I learned about the actual doing of it the more interested I got in it and got I got bit by the bug and decided to have a go and like, the first sort of stuff I did was naff as it would be um, I'd had a go as well when I was younger because we had a, a video camera at home and I'd made stuff using like toys that I had around the house. Um, but the first stuff I made as an adult was kind of naff. And then I made a documentary about my dad for his 50th birthday. And uh, that like had a real kind of emotional impact on my family. Like they like, really enjoyed it and it moved some of them to tears. So I was like, oh, all right, that <laughs> sounds okay. And so I decided to make a short film that I'd had written for a while. And that was called The House Near Apple Park, which is where the company gets its namesake from. And that, I sent that out to some blogs to get reviewed and people liked it. It got into some festivals, didn't win anything, but people saw it. And the feedback was really positive. Uh, And I did that off my own back using students that I had on the course at the college and then the sort of logic occurred to me well if I've made a short film in three days for 300 pounds then I can make a feature film in 30 days for x amount of pounds and I put together the money myself out of my wages and I partnered with a chap called Darren who wasn't a film producer but loved film and was by far and away the most organized man I know still is um and then as like new opportunities came up I found myself having to work with other people and different groups of people and so I found that quite liberating because the more variety of people I work with the more I learned and the better I got and I picked up stuff that I didn't know because I hadn't been to film school um so I, I just take the opportunity now to work with as wide a range of people as possible. For example, I've worked with Chris on this on the script and it's been a great experience. Um, but for the next film I'd like to do, I'd like to work with someone else on the script because it's a, a female-led horror film, body horror film. Um, so I think really the ideal person to write it would be a woman because we're going to have to take it to a woman at some point to say, is it, you know, is mm-hmm. this like right? Is it accurate? you know or is it a load of hogwash so I might as well start the journey with a woman writing it rather than write it myself or get a bloke to write it and then have to take it to someone else and get them to write it 
So, I, yeah, it's just, for me, it's about learning as much as I can, sort of developing as wide array of relationships as I can, because I didn't have that kind of film school thing. I didn't meet someone in my first year of film school and then grow from there. Okay. Um, so it's kind of been out of necessity and I've enjoyed working that way. Okay. All right, cool. Now, Chris and Tom, what's your experience with that? Do you like working with, like, do you like working in the same groups or do you like to branch out a bit too? Yeah, so I suppose I've had um, almost the opposite experience of Adam there because I did, um, went to university, did film production. And I think what really sort of set everything in motion is meeting two other teammates or who two other students who became teammates. This is Alex and Jordan, the other two thirds of From Here Stranger Films, our production company. And we sort of, um, so yeah, we got working together, realised we had the same sort of ideals and sort of vision of where we could sort of take independent filmmaking in terms of what we could do with not a huge amount of money um, okay. by doing it all ourselves, essentially. Um, so yeah, that's um, we set that company up to sort of make more of the work that we wanted to see. And that's kind of how we came to meeting with Adam when we were sort of uh, fishing out for other potential projects that we can maybe get involved in and sort of expand our portfolio a bit more. So yeah, we do like working together. Jordan will be DOPing the Maya. Um, so I've been able to bring him into this one. Um, but yeah, it's nice because you sort of get a sort of shorthand language when you're on set and you've got things you need to do. You don't need to spell everything out. You almost instinctively see the same thing at the same time. You're sort of looking at the camera, you see all that shadow needs adjusting and straight away you're both on the lights changing that, sorting it out there. Um, so yeah, um, I do like developing those sort of relationships and seeing what other people can do in different kind of capacities. Um, but it's also been exciting, for example, this is the first time I've worked with Chris on his scripts and that's completely, it's, put simply, it's a really good script and it's made the whole process so much more exciting having something you want to match the level of that script and quality of production which sort of sense that sort of benchmark to reach. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay, neat. Now, now, Chris, I don't know if you wanted to answer that question or if you just wanted to get into how you got on board the Meyer uh, and how I, you guys... Uh, yeah, okay. I, can, I can kind of do both. I mean, uh, sure. from my perspective, as a, as a screenwriter, I, I, I'm looking at it from a very different way. And in terms of working with people, you don't tend to do that so much unless you're co-writing something or... In the case of what uh, Adam and Tom did with me, we pretty much developed this from the ground up. So it starts with an idea and we elaborate on that idea and then I go off and I write the script. And it's, it's kind of worked in that process, which is something I've never done before. Adam and I had been talking for about five years. I'd actually seen his first film, Little Pieces, uh, his first feature film, uh, in a capacity as a film critic. I was writing for uh, a couple of film periodicals at the time and uh, I got a screener of his film I reviewed it and uh, I thought it was something quite special when you consider how much money he made it for I thought that what he did with that was really terrific and we started a rapport off the back of that review and we exchanged a couple of scripts here and there over the years and it was only uh, this time last year in fact I believe that we firmly decided that right we'll try and develop a project together and uh, it was all about what are you passionate about? What are you interested in? What kind of subject matter do you want to deal with? And uh, Adam had this little list of things he was interested in. And we clicked on the idea that is the subject matter behind the mire. And like I say, it's a process that I'm not used to because generally I write spec scripts. I don't write for other people and I don't write on a commission basis, uh, although that's changed in the last uh, few months or so. So I'm used to sitting down at a typewriter and writing out the entire script for myself having no preconception as to whether or not it's going to get made whether or not it's going to go anywhere i'm writing it just for me uh so this was the first experience i've had of writing something with an eye towards the production schedule and with an eye towards budget and with an eye towards having to deal with this new environment that we're now all having to work within which is pre uh post covid so you're looking at uh, smaller production uh, you're looking at less cast, less crew, less money. Uh, and 
being able to start with that notion in mind and then try and adapt to your style and find a way to tell a story within certain restrictions is very akin to the independent spirit anyway, because you always know you only have a limited amount of resources. These films don't tend to get made for a huge amount of money. And so that was the big challenge for me was to see if I could adapt to that process. And thankfully, having someone like Adam and Tom as collaborators, collaboration is not a dirty word as far as I'm concerned. It's all for the good of the story and all to try and get a script as good as it can be. And uh, I, I think that the experience for me has certainly been a positive one. So it's, it's nice to hear that the other two found it positive as well. I just wanted to go back. You, you, you work on a typewriter? <laughs> uh, uh, initially, I can work on a typewriter. Uh, I, okay. I, I used to, to be honest with you. Typewriters just that uh, <laughs> I'm just so used to. It. See, I'm, I'm, I'm 41 years old this year. I, I'm, I'm used to remembering when I used to work on a typewriter. I work on a laptop usually. The, the first draft is always handwritten. And then I type it out and that becomes the, the dog draft, as I call it. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, Hand, handwritten, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now, can we talk about just um, the premise of the Meyer? And just, I guess I'll have you guys pitch it. Um, Adam? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a contained thriller, is how I describe it. It's about this... A cult leader who has swindled all the money out of his followers. He's convinced them to give up their earthly belongings and donate the proceeds to him uh, because he's convinced them that they're about to ascend, as he puts it, um, which is his word for a planned mass suicide. And then he has no intention of actually seeing that through. He just wants the money. So the night before this is due to happen, he's getting his ducks in a row, if you will, and he's about to leave, and his two top lieutenants trap him in the church that they've been working out of for eight years because they absolutely believe everything he's told them. And they're trying to convince him to come back into the fold and to join the mass suicide, and he's trapped because he knows he's been lying, and all the defences he's put in to stop other people accusing him of lying now don't and they're working too well against him. So, uh, yeah, it's a battle of wits played out across the course of an evening as they try and bring him back into the fold and he tries to convince them that they have to let him go because he's received new directives from the beings that they worship. And uh, intercut with all of that, we see how this horrible man has taken two very vulnerable people at the lowest points of their lives and manipulated them into believing um, utter rubbish, basically, and entrenching themselves so much in this belief system that you know, for them it's all or nothing. Okay. Um, especially for the Marshall character who he's been with the longest, for him it is all or nothing. He's looking forward to committing suicide because it's the only thing left in his life that gives meaning he's been so manipulated. It's a, it's a contained thriller, it's a morality tale, it's all sorts of different things going on in there, and it's a really exciting screenplay with three incredibly complicated and interesting characters that explores a lot of themes and ideas that I'm really curious about. Okay, that's super neat. Now, um, to let the listeners know that this is at that crowdfunding stage, just you're getting, you guys are getting the last bits of funds to start filming in October? Yeah, we've um, we before we went into crowdfunding, we secured we'd secured about eighty four percent of the money. Um, with the current crowdfunding, at the point where it's at the minute, we're only about sort of ten days in. We've now we now need to secure about the last twelve percent, I believe it is something like that. So we're almost there. This is the last sort of percentages for the money so that we can get everything in order, ready to shoot in October. Okay. Now, what happens if you don't raise that last bit? We have contingencies in place, okay. um, but it is in everybody's interest for us in terms of maintaining control over the picture that we do it independently. Okay. <laughs> you made that sound like a threat, Adam. Uh, <laughs> It's yeah, in your it wasn't quite so menacing, but 
you know, if, if we have to take money from elsewhere, then we lose some of that control that we have over it. There becomes another voice in the mix okay. um, rather than ours, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to maintain those our creative vision. Work from the it's incredibly difficult, particularly in uh, the UK, to get any film made at any budget, to be honest with you. So to be doing micro-budget filmmaking on this level uh, for a film that we we think is actually rather complex and quite profound and has important things to say but is also grassroots a great psychological thriller so trying to find financing for any film in this country is very difficult so we're we're just really trying our hardest to keep as much control as possible because as Adam says the the, the more you have to rely on other means to fund your work the more compromises you have to make and this is a film that won't suit too many voices it won't suit too many compromises okay so that's why you said it so menacingly that it needs to <laughs> yeah <laughs> everyone at the minute it's exactly kind of like the story that i want to tell and it deals with things that i'm interested in okay um and you know if we add a sort of fourth voice into that mix then we run the risk of it potentially having to become something else because you know if someone has to give us a massive chunk of our budget then you know we do kind of we do have to listen to what they say um and for me at the minute it's kind of like an exploration of people and how people will use vulnerable people to manipulate them and it's a study of what people believe because um, I'm, I'm agnostic um but I find the idea of people's beliefs quite fascinating um, and I find the way that some people will manipulate those beliefs even more fascinating. Uh, I was raised Roman Catholic, I, was, I went to a Roman Catholic primary school and I've said this to someone else earlier this week, uh, I'm fascinated by how in the US there are these, these mega preachers who have huge churches, they earn millions of dollars a year live in massive houses, drive incredibly fancy cars and such. And yet my, and admittedly being agnostic, I haven't read the Bible in a meaningful way for quite some time, but I'm pretty sure the Bible had very clear views on that sort of thing and they weren't supportive. It wasn't supportive of it. So I'm quite fascinated by this idea of how someone can to manipulate people into believing otherwise and to giving up that much money, you know, because you've got to be taking mon a lot of money from a lot of people to be able to earn that much. Um, and I find that quite fascinating. And that's all there in the Maya. And that's the kind of, that's the stuff that interests me and the stuff that I really want to look at, um, you know, and I would, but we've done it in a way that's not preachy and not directly a criticism of anything in particular, of any sort of religion or faith group in particular. And I, would, I wouldn't want someone else to then come in and say like, well, actually, I think that it needs to be this. And if you, need, if you want my X amount of pounds, then you know, you're going to write the, rewrite the script so that it suits that. Originally, like it was meant to be much more of a... Um... There's a better word than cheap affair. Like we're as a concept, we're talking about just getting a script done, getting some people together and shooting it over last summer, basically. Um, you know, we're still quite early on in the first wave of COVID trying to sort of get work out what the future was going to look like. And we thought we had the chance of putting some pieces together. So when things did open up, we can just actually go out and shoot. But then when we got the first draft of the script, it was a lot more, as again, we talked about the depth and the complexity to it. We really thought, oh, we, we can't rush this. We really want to take our time with it. And, you know, time needs buying a lot more security, a lot more um, time to sort of almost experiment, see what works, play with the characters more. So, yeah, it was, it went for something that we were thinking of trying to make to have made it and move on to something else to something that's sort of become all-encompassing in our lives like we really want to match the potential of the story okay. we're, see, we're seeing how the manipulation of people's beliefs and faiths that's playing out every day even more as time goes on 
So yeah, it's very contemporary in that sense. Okay. Yeah, the film, uh, the script that Chris sent me before we started really talking about the mile was um, was a, a two hander in a lift, and it was like a a, like a, a nasty little like, horror, exploitation horror film at, at its core. And it was just a case of like I could do that, you know. I only need a, a big space where I can build a lift. And um, unfortunately, there were other bidders in line for that, and they were able to put together a quote and an idea and a package far quicker than I was able to. So uh, from not getting that script, then came the conversation about, well, let's do something else and we'll develop it from the ground up. Okay, nice. Now, what was the research like for, your, for all you guys? Was that just you, Chris, <coughs> doing the research or were you guys able to do so much? Yeah, I mean... I, th I think Ad Adam and Tom have done their fair share of research, I'm sure. I know that Adam's fascinated by cults and the idea of cults, so, and so am I. But the, the books that I'd read had been mostly the sort of books that everybody reads, like Helter Skelter and things like that, stuff like the Manson family. But I had to go, I've, I've, I've said this in a few other places, but I, I felt like I was having to magpie different pieces of different cults and different organisations and communities to try and hone together something for us that was different but familiar, if that makes sense. Because I, I didn't want to reference anything specifically, but there's there's a little bit of Scientology in there with the idea of Dianetics. There's a little bit of uh, the Jonestown mentality of the, the, the freedom of people movements. Uh, and there's a huge amount of the Heaven's Gate uh, community, which uh, I think those last two in particular, you take an amalgamation of uh, Jim Jones and the Heaven's Gate cults put those together and you get quite close to the kind of thing I was interested in exploring and it's it always comes down to two factors which is uh money and control more than anything and the notion of one person being able to uh have this much influence and this much hold of over a lot of people often with incredibly elaborate and often ludicrous notions behind them the foundations of some of these cults are are you you wonder as somebody from the outside of it how anybody could get ensnared into it because it sounds insane nine times out of ten but that's where it comes down to the the kind of people that they go after they're always vulnerable people and most of the books that i was reading for my research i'd say nine times out of ten were books of victims who and, and survivors who had managed to get out so you're getting their perspective on the inner workings of how these things were put together. And then you've got some very smart uh, researchers who are able to give you the idea of the building blocks of how you would how you would create something out of thin air, essentially, how you could create a belief system where there's no proof, no facts. You're making it up as you go along. And that's that's something that we wanted to have in the script. It's about faith in the 21st century and how we are all kind of adrift and we are all looking to latch on to anything to believe in to give us some substance. And it's, I, I wanted to explore that a little bit. And there's a, there's a, there's a lot of material out there. Um, there's a lot of documentaries. Cults seem to be having a big sort of renaissance. I don't know if it's anything to do with the lockdown, but uh, there's documentaries everywhere on them at the moment. The last, the last really good one I watched was the, did anybody see the Wild Wild Country on Netflix? About the... Uh, the, the the Indian community that moved into this patch in the middle of America and they just built a city and it's, oh. it's such a wild crazy story and I couldn't believe I'd never heard of it before but this is like a 10-part documentary which was That's fascinating cool. to see because it goes from the grassroots beginnings of how this started and it just escalates and escalates towards something you couldn't possibly imagine and man that's your narrative for a story right there so I mean yeah, in terms of research, books and documentaries was uh, was where I went to for that. It was about about two months of research before I started the script. Okay, I love cults too, so that must have been like a fun two months. <laughs> <laughs> scary two months. There's some very very scary stories in there, um, which of course we've tried to incorporate in there as well. There's a, there's a, I, I I like to think there's a sense of dread that runs throughout our story um and and rightly so because it's it says as adam says going back to the idea of morality it's a morality tale about an immoral person and that's the that's kind of the that's been the signature line that i've been using to kind of describe what the script is about my research has been 
Um, it's been different depending on what I'm working with, um, what aspect of the film I'm working with. So uh, with the cast, um, they've been looking at documentaries. Uh, and this differs from cast member to cast member because each one's, uh, each person that we're working with uh, needs something uh, a little bit different and is interested in slightly different things. Um, so, for example, Anthony, uh, who plays the cult leader, I've worked quite closely with him for quite a while and we've had lots of long conversations and I've actually had him watching uh, politicians and public speakers um, and uh, people like that as opposed to cult leaders because when you watch a cult leader you inherently kind of understand that there's something not right and that it is a bit creepy and I don't want him to be creepy I want him to be a salesman essentially I kind of imagine that this guy, uh, Joseph Layton, got his start selling timeshares that were a load of rubbish in, on a Mediterranean island somewhere, um, which is something that I encountered when I was younger. We went on holiday to, um, to an island in the Med and someone tried to sell us a timeshare for a villa. And my dad was like, I need to go away and think about it. And then literally like four weeks later, we were watching the news at home and like, people had been ripped off significantly by these people selling timeshares that didn't exist. Um, so I kind of imagine that he probably started doing something like that and then realised that there was a bigger and bigger picture. So for, for Anthony, I've been having him watch politicians um, and also, uh, you know, these sort of like tech wizards that like to do big things. Steve Jobs is quite an interesting case study. Um, one could argue that he was in a way a cult leader um but not necessarily the malicious type but he's an interesting person just from a public speaking perspective who he is um joe who plays marshall he uh, wanted a lot of documentaries looking from the perspective of victims so he's looked at a lot of scientology stuff um and a couple of documentaries on netflix Whereas Holly, who plays Hannah, um, has been quite content to have a few conversations with me about it. And then once we realised we were on the same page, she's wanted to head off and develop the character on her own and then come back as we get closer to filming. So, you know, the research for them has been very different individually with each person, depending on what they need. Um, and that's part of the fascination of directing actors. You know, that's the most fascinating part because each one needs something slightly different from you as the director. Um, you know, I've talked a lot with Anthony and we've spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, whereas I've spent very little time talking with Holly about the character and the film. And we've spent a lot more time talking about fantasy books and stuff and just getting to know each other <laughs> and so forth. Because that sort of relationship is equally as important because you need to trust the person. Um, so that's been quite fascinating for them. From my own sort of perspective and working with Jordan, who's DOPing it, um, I got him to watch like a really wide array of films that are not necessarily the films you would expect, not necessarily thrillers not necessarily um, contained films, but films that are a lot of people talking. So a lot of Aaron Sorkin films, I've had him watching those to look at like the interesting ways to cover dialogue and make it interesting. Um, like the Steve Jobs, Jobs movie oh, yeah. in particular, like that was a big one. It was just like, you know, watch this because I, you know, I think that film is absolutely cracking. And it is just a guy on stage talking for like a big part of it or the build up to the guy on stage talking yet you are like hooked to it it's it's brilliant it's brilliantly done danny boyle and aaron sorkin like did a fantastic job bringing that together and i think it's more important to watch things like that than to watch other thriller films necessarily he's also watched a couple of other thriller films and um we've talked about like other films that are visually what we're looking at. But for me, the interesting thing is about how do we take this very dialogue heavy script and 
cover it in interesting ways. So that's what my research has been primarily into. So for the performers, it's been different depending on their needs. And from a directorial perspective, in terms of visuals, it's been what films are interesting to look at, but aren't necessarily thrillers, but involve lots of talking. The Social Network is another one. You know, it's a film about the making of a website, and yet it is riveting. Yeah. Um, so we've looked a lot at stuff like that. Okay, interesting. I don't know about you, Tom. I mean, in terms of research, it's all always been for me just a case of just following your curiosity I guess like rather than blocking out time say to read books about something it is just sort of seeing something on the shelf in a shop and think oh I like the sound of that and then sort of falling down a rabbit hole you know when it's like when you're looking at something on the internet and it's almost come to half uh, well two or three hours later when you've just been reading about new things, <laughs> you wonder where all the time's gone. Um, yeah. And that's often led to some interesting insights into whether it's stories or characters. It's never the ones you're thinking about either. You might set out to research cults, but find something about belonging that fits a romance story you're thinking about so completely differently, you know, that need to be recognised or even seen yeah, so it's a lot more playful, I think, as a way to I'd, I'd sort of approach it, just generally. I mean, Can you guys talk about the casting process? Because I, I know you said in the, the little intro video on the crowdfunding that you guys did it over Zoom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, uh, Full day. Experience. Full day, just like back-to-back meetings. Um, okay. And very much like rapid fire. So I think we, we did... We didn't break them down by roles, did we, Adam? We just put to two days of both um yeah uh, we holly and we, uh, we got quite a few um applications we did an open we did an open casting for the marshall and the hannah role um i knew as soon as i read the script that i wanted anthony in the joseph role just okay. knew like i knew he would he was the he was the one bar like daniel day lewis being available um <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew I knew Anthony was the one. So, you know, he did uh, a reading, and then we talked about it and had a pretty long conversation. I think I spoke to him for about two hours about the film and what I saw it as being and where it was, and you know, came to the point where I just said to him, "Look, if you want to do it, it's yours. I'm happy to to go for it." Um, and then we, we put out an open call for the Hannah and Marshall characters. We got quite a few applications, quite a few indeed. Um, and then we saw, we yeah, we set aside a day or two to go through the ones we wanted to see. Um, we tried to keep it as local as possible at first and keep it in Portsmouth or people who have bases in Portsmouth and then try and, and branch out if we had to. Um, and fortunately, like the majority of the people we're working with are people who are have a base in Portsmouth or are based in Portsmouth because I really want to do as much as I can to work in this area and use talent from this area. Um, yeah, it was, we saw about six people for each role. Each of those was over Zoom. The first audition, uh, we had their first meeting with Joseph and Anthony, bless him, uh, agreed to do the auditions opposite them on Zoom. So we had them, uh, we had the candidates going opposite Anthony. And that was quite a fascinating procedure just to watch in and of its own because Anthony was able to sort of develop the character as he went mm. within that context. And his line readings at the beginning of the day when he was opposite people you could sort of see him fall into a rhythm and build the character and develop it over time, over the course of the day, as just as he tried new things to keep it fresh for himself. Um, and as he reacted to the people we were seeing. Um, so yeah, we did a whole day of it. We saw about six people for each role. Um, everybody who we saw for Hannah, 
was really good. And it was quite hard to narrow that one down to the two people we then did for callbacks. Marshall was a slightly different story. We couldn't quite find the right person for quite a while. Um, and we saw some people two or three times and it just wasn't quite clicking. Um, there was a lad who was kind of 70% there. And I think that if we had to go with him, we probably could have bought him the rest of the way up. But uh, then we, Tom sent me Joe's uh, showreel, the chap who is playing Marshall now. And like his showreel is really varied. Like he's got quite a range just within his showreel. And I was like, all right, yeah, let's see him. And he came on and <laughs> he had a really long audition because he did the, the first reading, which was just um, have a look at this and do it as you would do it. And let's see what you bring to it, which is how I like to do first auditions all the time. I want to see what they can bring to it. Um, we then had a chat with him about the film. And then he did uh, the second audition, which was um, a bit that was later on in the film. And he did the first reading of it was his interpretation of it. And then I gave him a bit of direction and he did it a second time. And he, he came in and he just like, he, it, it was, it was absolutely mind blowing, but like, he absolutely nailed it in his interpretation of it. He moved himself to tears in the first audition, which like that's commitment right there. Um, you know, he bought everything and he took the direction really well in the second one uh, because he'd got it right the first time around. He'd got it how it's written and how I see it. I had to give him like a, a, a kind of like a weird bit of direction that I wouldn't give him, but I just wanted to make sure that he could do something almost the opposite of what he'd done just so that I can set tell he can take direction. So, and he did it. He like, he nailed it. He didn't question it. He just, he interpreted it and went for it. And what so we weird, went with Joe. Sorry, what was the weird direction? The weird direction? Spoiler. I can't remember precisely what it was, but it was kind of like, um, Right in the scene, he's got to be particularly confrontational. Okay. And I think because he he played it confrontational and direct, I said like you know this time I want to plead with him and beg with him, beg him, almost, which is like not quite how I would do it. Okay. Um. In the but it was it was different enough to be able to tell that he could do, um, that he could take direction. Um, because sometimes when you're dealing with people who who you've never met before, you you know you've got to be sure that someone can take direction. Um, I had this experience in an older film, uh, working with an actor who who had decided what the role was, and that was what he was going to do. And when I tried to direct him, um, we just got what he decided he wanted to do again. Um, Okay. And but because we were already moving, we didn't have time to to recast him. So um, after that, I vowed I would never make that mistake again. Um, okay. So He's just stuck in his vision of what the character would be. Yeah, not taking direction. Yeah, he okay. he had decided who the character was. Um, and then and then Joe came in and did the callbacks for the Hannah character because I wanted to see how they were opposite um joe and they and you know he again he just bought it he bought it he bought 100 percent into the audition you know, he gave it 100 percent, even though he was secure in his role he he went you know he just he gave 100 percent the whole way and it's great and um picking which of the two young ladies um we went with holly um, they were both Holly and the other person gave incredible performances. And that was like really hard. I had to think about that for like two days about which of the two of them was quite, it was just ever so slightly nearer to my vision for the character than the other, you know, but they were both great. And like, um, you know, Holly's going to be amazing in this role. And I'm going to do something with the other young lady because she's brilliant and I want to do something with her as well um so you know the audition process was 
I like being in the room and feeling the energy and Zoom doesn't allow you to do that. So this is the most indecisive I've been the whole in my entire filmmaking career. Usually when I'm in the room and someone comes in and does a reading, like I know kind of then that that's the person. Now, I'd love to ask, just um, you mentioned that you're, it's going to be a local film in Portsmouth, and I'd love to hear why you want to, why it's so important to you to make it local and what it was like finding lo the location for the film. Um, the location was uh, half by accident. Um, when I was reading the first Chris, uh, the first script that Chris sent me, not the first Chris. Um, <laughs> there was a Chris before me. What the hell, man? <laughs> Long line of Chris. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, when, I, when I was reading that first uh, script, um, I sent it to Tom, and Tom got in touch with a chap that we both know who's really good at finding spaces. In the he knows everyone. That's the source. Yeah, he knows yeah. everyone. He's 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 just great. If you need something, ask he, him and he'll he, find it. He's probably named Chris too, right? <laughs> Can he find the first Chris for me? <laughs> no one's gonna find the first Chris. <laughs> um and he came back to us. We need a big plate. We said, like, I mean, we need a place where we can build a a freight elevator. And and of course he said, leave it with me. And he got back to us. And there was this hall at the top of a church um, that's local in the area. And it was ideal. It was massive space. You know, we could build the set in it. We could put lights in it in the right places and like, have room to move the camera. And it would have been absolutely top notch. And of course that fell through. But I was looking at the church's website and their main hall is incredible. It's a gorgeous piece of architecture. And then they also have uh, smaller rooms that we can do other bits and pieces in as well so everything we needed was in under one roof in this church oh, cool. and we got in touch with them and they seemed well up for it um so we got involved with them we're still talking with them because at the time everything was closed down and now things are opening up so we need to be a bit more specific about what we need and when but um that was how the lo we found the location Okay. And so the script is written with this location in mind. It is transferable if, we, if it doesn't quite work out, but ideally we'll, we'll be at this place because like, we can leave stuff there. It's all in one place. We don't have to move stuff around. Um, it's ideal. But I, I, I want to make things in Portsmouth because I'm, I'm from Portsmouth. I've lived here a better part of my life. And I, I think it's an interesting city visually because it's incredibly condensed. It's very dense where it's on an island it's everything's kind of squashed in and you can walk uh you can be in one part of the city which is quite bohemian and oldie worldy and like has houses left over from the 30s and 40s and you can walk 20 meters up the road and be in densely populated terraced houses um and it's just vastly different geography like within really short distances of each other um and because i live here and i know it I, I know the interesting places visually and it doesn't look like I could go to London and make a film, but I don't know London. Um, you know, I, I go there and then London's a really interesting place for me because I, I, I always look forward to going, but as soon as I'm there, I can't wait to leave. Um, so it's like I could go there, but it would just be the same old places that you see all the time because they're the only places that I know. Whereas in Portsmouth, it will look different, it will feel different. And it, you know, that's kind of like part of, you know, it, it adds a bit of diversity to the whole thing. Um, so that's that's why I want to make films in Portsmouth, because like, I know it, it's in the blood. Okay. Okay, neat. Tom, have you been to Portsmouth? Yeah, so that's where um, I went to uni. So I spent okay. five years there. It was only after um after the first wave of COVID hit, I sort of had to look at my options, think, all right, probably move back in with my family for the short term. Um, and that was uh, over a year ago now. So I was very lucky to be able to have that option, but I am looking at ways of getting back down there again, because like Adam sort of saying, it's a unique city. And also it's one where I know lots of people who want to make cool stuff. And that's sort of where I want to be. Okay. 
cool chris have you ever been i know you were near scotland i think yeah no i've never been i've never been uh, that far south i don't think even in terms of the country down in england i think uh, the furthest south i think i've ever been is tunbridge wells maybe mm -hmm. um <laughs> but uh no I, but whenever i discovered that he wanted to set the film there i did a bit of research into it. i wanted to know the layout of the city because it was a city i wasn't familiar with and uh knowing that there is like a, a waterfront and all that sort of stuff i thought right i can put that into the script somewhere and i can do this there whatever that was very interesting to me was that he gave me the specs on this location that he had where we were going to set the pretty much 95 percent of the movie and I'd never written for something specifically, but it was great because I had an idea of like which rooms things could take place in. And you can almost play almost like a game of chess in terms of where people are in the building. Uh, and it's an extraordinary location. And uh, from what I've researched, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful city. And very, like Adam said, it's very diverse, very uh, visually interesting. Um, and... Uh, that's another interesting thing about this whole process for us is that I, I've never met face to face Adam or Tom yet. And we've been developing this over a year and, you know, we're getting close to shooting now. And I still have never actually been in a room with these guys. And I think there's something as limiting as Zoom and all that sort of stuff can be. I think the pandemic has in some ways managed to bring a lot of people together. Uh, as certainly creative people. And I think it's been a lifeline for a lot of people as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a, an optimistic person by nature. So I like to try and spin positives out of anything. And this for me has been a real positive. Okay, cool. Now, are, are you going to go down for the filming or, or are you just trusting them with the baby? <laughs> um, I, I, I am usually of the sense that a writer should probably stay the hell away. I've had a few experiences sure. in the past with stuff that I've written where uh, I've gone down for maybe the first day of shooting just to be there to see the first like get cut and to see them do the first shot stuff like that when it comes to things like this logistically at the moment i'm in pre-production duties with another feature film uh so i'm kind of a little too busy with that and i'm rewriting a script for somebody else just now i've got a nine-year-old daughter she's going to be in school at the time that we're shooting just logistically it probably don't, won't happen but i i do intend when i'm on my travels because i know i'm going to be moving about quite a bit in the next six or seven months i do intend on getting down there to at least get in a room and have a meeting with these two gentlemen uh <laughs> yeah ho hope so. hopefully with some footage to be shown or hopefully to see the the finished product we'll see be a wrapped drink hopefully something like that yeah exactly yeah incredibly densely populated city is there's a remarkable amount of pubs yes, right. yes. there you go yeah. Okay. I'm, Scot I'm Scottish, so that, that sort of thing is just... But interesting, like interesting me. I was going to High Wycombe to be, uh, to be edited, so that's where the editor lives. So again, oh, really? okay. diverse. But uh, Jake studied in Portsmouth, he studied film production in Portsmouth, but he moved to High Wycombe to be nearer Pinewood, ah. which is where he's based. But So I've got to send everything up to him. But Jake's a brilliant editor, and I trust him in my absolutely that he will do the film make the film better now i have three more two are specific to the crowdfunding which is of course what we came to talk about but i just i love getting into the ideas of the movie um so i just i'd love to ask one more about just kind of the script we don't need to spoil too much but i was just are there any scenes that might be challenging or ones that you're really looking forward to filming um uh, it, there's one there's a big scene towards the end that's very challenging in terms of how to cover it because it happens in a really wide open space and there's um, a bit of action and fighting in it that needs to be covered in a way that keeps everyone safe and makes sure that we live within our we work within our means, okay. but also um, ensures that it stays visceral and engaging for the audience and doesn't feel like we've cheated them out of any sort of payoff so that will be quite challenging how i think we've done it i think jordan and i have got it um got it right um but so much of what you plan goes out the window on the day um sure there's a scene before that that is about 10 pages long 
which is where everything emotionally comes to a head. Um, and it's where, you know, he's decided that the best way out is to just go for it and antagonize them as much as possible. Okay. And so this, I'm picking my words carefully because I don't want to <clears throat> give anything away. Um, but yeah, that pay, that scene is 10 pages long. Um, you've got <laughs> the emotional payoff of three characters in there. Um, and it, that has been quite, that was quite a challenge to cover in a visual manner as well. But because there's so many dramatic beats, I'm really excited to see how it works and how we do it. I think we might be like dedicating a, a, a lot of one day just to that sequence. Um, but yeah, that's quite a, I'm quite looking forward to seeing how that pays off. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, there's not really any scenes in it that I'm not looking forward to to shooting because uh, there's something happens in every scene um you know there's an emotional payoff in every scene uh it, it's i'm really excited to get the whole thing in the can and to see like what sort of thing we bring together on set once we get these three actors in a room and they're actually really going for it okay it's neat and actually get them in a room and not a zoom room <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we did a reading on Zoom. We did a, a table read on Zoom and it was interesting because we got to hear the words spoken aloud. But because it's on Zoom and they can't move around and they can't, you know, really go for it, it, it doesn't have the same weight. It was really interesting to hear the sort of balance of voices in the, the table read um, and realise that there was one character who probably wasn't speaking as much as they should be um, and going back and rectifying that. Well, yeah. I will say this, that Adam is the second director today to tell me that uh, there's been a, a scene that's been way too long. <laughs> I didn't say it was too long, I just said it was 10 pages long. <laughs> I, 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 just want, I just want to add to that, that uh, it's, it's not the best screenwriting practice to write scenes that are 10 pages, 15 pages long. But uh, I, I seem to have a habit of doing stuff like that. Break it, and for a director, that's a nightmare because they have to break down the scene for their shooting. And have to yeah. be bridges and places that you can move away from it. And uh, yeah, this other film that I'm in the middle of at the moment, I was just speaking to the director today and he was like, what possessed you to write 15 pages <laughs> of dialogue with no break and no cutaway? Or... So uh, I like to give the director a challenge. <laughs> I did it just for you. <laughs> the scene is like really, the scene's really well written. I didn't actually say it was too long. I just said it was 10 pages long. Um, because there are plenty of emotional points in there. And what was really great, one of, I really like the script breakdown part of the thing because I can then work out like where the power relationships lie and when that power switches. And then once you've worked that out, that allows you to figure out what shots you want because your shots then reflect the power relationships between these three characters and how they work. Um, and, you know, that scene is full of a variety of different breaks and changes that we can do. And because we're shooting with two cameras for the vast majority of it, it gives us a good chance to, you know, it will speed up the process incredibly. Okay, neat. And I also just want, I do want to mention that I went to school for script writing. So like, I, I totally know that I am, I am guilty. I write too long and I am guilty <laughs> of the very same, making too many. Fantastic. Solidarity, brother. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, I'd love to ask a couple of questions about like just the crowdfunding and specific to that. Um, can you guys talk about what it was like thinking about the perks? Because I feel like that would be a fun process. Yeah, we did it differently this time around. This is our second crowdfunding campaign. And the first time around, we did um, the usual sort of thing. We put in uh, things like T-shirts and so on and so forth. And then it was only once we realized... Uh, once the money had kind of come in and we were looking at what we got, that we were then going to be spending like a lot of money from the money we'd earned fulfilling the perks. So this time around, we've tried to offer things that don't cost anything for us to make. So we're offering, uh, Chris is offering to write a monologue for actors. Uh, Chris and I are offering to give notes on people's screenplays. Uh, Imran, who's composing the score, has said that 
uh, we can give people digital copies of the score. Um, so things that the, we're offering people the opportunity to, to be a part of the film, uh, props that we've got that haven't already been bought, we're offering that. We're offering uh, a watch party online. We're going to show the film over Zoom and bring people in to watch it with us and we'll laugh and joke and, okay. you know, um, hopefully not cry when people hate it and <laughs> go from there. Uh, so this time around, there was a real onus on doing things that, you know, would allow all the money we raised to be shown on the screen rather than having to spend a big chunk of it creating perks and such. Okay. I, I sound th th there were some fun perks in there, especially with the monologue thing, Chris. So mm. you would you would write anything that they want? Yeah, we were limit, limiting it to three pages. I, I just I have so many followers on Twitter who are these just wonderful actors who we're always doing self tapes and going to auditions and like that. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if they had a self tape or a monologue that they could deliver that is absolutely specifically tailored to what they want to do, what they want to perform? Because often you have to go and find a speech, be it Shakespeare or Tony Kushner or any of these other ones, and you have to try and find something that will give you a chance to emote. But if I can get these people to one side we can have a little just one-on-one -on -one like this we can say well what do you want what do you want to do what kind of performance do you want to give what kind of part do you want to play and i can go away and i'll, I'll write them a three-page monologue because as we've heard i have got no problem writing long <laughs> reams of dialogue and uh i've done a couple for friends i've got a couple actor friends up here uh, in aberdeen uh who have often asked me to do little monologues from like i had one and they're always weirdly specific ones i noticed which is where I, we kind of got the idea like well if we we can make it so that the actor can ask us what they would like to, what they want. Uh, the, the one that I had to write recently was a princess having a mental breakdown. So I had to go off and write a three page monologue about a princess having a mental breakdown. And that's also fun as well. It's quite fun. So I've got no problem with that, but I think it's, uh, it's a nice creative alternative to just simply giving someone a shout out on social media to be able to say, well, I write, so here, we can offer you this. And, it, and again, it's, it's not going to cost the production. All it's going to cost is a bit of time. And uh, I have got no problem giving my time to creative people. So that's, uh, for me, I thought was a really fun one. Okay. What's, what's the weirdest request that you've gotten? <laughs> uh, for a monologue for, or for, yeah. a, for a piece of... Um, I, haven't had a, I haven't had any weird requests for monologues. I did have a filmmaker once, uh, again, in Aberdeen. He wanted to make a short film. And he wanted to make a short film about uh, possessed shopping trolleys, <laughs> shopping carts. He wanted to do a he wanted to do a short film about that, and uh, he told me his idea, and I, I, I politely declined on that one. But uh, up in Aberdeen, uh, in the north, which is a big city in the northeast of Scotland, for those who aren't familiar, uh, the the <laughs> film community is quite small, but they are very dedicated to horror films. There's a lot of horror films come out of that neck of the woods, and. Uh, I wrote my fair share of them, a lot of which didn't get produced, a couple of which they shot, but uh, I was I was always very interested in trying something a little bit more ambitious. And thankfully we've got smart people like Adam and Tom who are willing to give me the chance to do that. Cool. And apparently they're kind of weird in Aberdeen too. <laughs> I take it with the, um, the trolleys. <laughs> yeah, I am saying made, I am uh, saying Someone nothing. made rubber and that's about a possessed tire. So, you know. Yes, yeah, that's true. That's true. I'd see the possessed shop and trolley moon. I'd watch it. I would. Actually, You'd watch yeah. it. I'd oh, watch maybe it. Yeah. Up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Email I'd, I'd watch that if someone. I says, still I'll have his number. I might. Give him a call. Possessed shop and trolley. I'd be like, yeah, all right, let's stick it on. We'll, let's go. we'll see how the Meyer does. <laughs> cool. Now I will have you guys just plug once more, just where we can find the. Uh, obviously, I'll have the crowdfunding link in the the post, but if we could just say when it ends and why you want why you think it's important for people to contribute so it's on um it's on greenlit which is a, a crowdfunding platform specifically designed for film and drama productions and okay. um so it doesn't get tied down with it doesn't get sort of mixed in with lots of tech startups like indiegogo has and such um i think it's really important to support it just because like 
independent film is is quite precious. You know, you'll get stories in independent film that you won't get anywhere else, be it about a cult leader who manipulates people or a possessed shopping trolley. You know, um, Marvel ain't taking a bet on uh, a possessed shopping trolley movie anytime soon. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you will get stuff that's niche and interesting and different. And, um, you know, it's important to support those communities. And I don't by that just mean us, but I mean everybody um, within the independent film community. It also supports localised filmmaking, so it shows it's helping make a film that's made like outside of London. It will feel different from a typical British film. Um, we do two low-budget types of films very well here, and that is like niche little dramas set in seaside towns in the summer, and we do gangster films low budget very, very well. And this is a chance to do something that's outside of those two dramas. You know, I'm not knocking, I'm not knocking those two genres at all. Like, you know, My Summer of Love is an absolutely brilliant film and I love it the bits. Um, but this is a chance to make a British film that's outside those two genres that were low budget genres that we're particularly known for. And I think any chance to do that is fantastic. And to do it in a city that's as interesting visually as Portsmouth, that doesn't feel like London or look like London is going to be, just add to that. Okay. Okay, cool. Tom, Chris, do you have anything to add to that? Or did Adam just say it? I'm, I was going to let Tom go first. <laughs> I did have something to say, and it fell right in my mind the moment you said it. Chris, please go ahead. Okay. I mean... I'm a big fan of supporting uh, creative people. And uh, I know a great many of them who are always trying their best to create something interesting and different and new. And unfortunately, as we talked about a little earlier in the, the, the podcast, these sort of things, these sort of projects don't tend to get made. And if they do, yeah, our idea of low budget in this country, if you're looking at proper financing, is even quite a ludicrous notion because you'll have things like Wild Rose that will get made. But those are still getting made for like a million, two million pounds. And okay. we're, we're, we're looking to do things that are you know, prob probably not as... <sighs> I don't know if not commercial is the right sense because I think that we, we have a gripping thriller on our hands here, but... It's not your usual gripping thriller. And what's great about this sort of way of funding is that you get like-minded people putting their contribution in because they are passionate about what they're hearing and they like what they hear that we want to do and they want to see that movie. And I think you'll find that a lot of people want to see different work. As Adam says, we, we you know, for a long time, the British film industry was, uh, the art films like a Peter Greenaway picture and a Bond film I know, and even the Bond films are not being financed through our industry it, it, it all sort of like bounces back and I'd, I'd like to see us be as diverse as it looked for a second there after Shallow Grave and Trainspotting came out there in the 90s there was this little glory moment we were, we were producing so much stuff uh, and a variety of different things there was a time when uh, you know the industry would have uh, laughed at somebody at, at, at financing a film like a Mr. Bean movie. But those movies are really important for us to have an industry that can grow and be diverse and be able to play in a bigger playground and make money and make box office. And, you know, as great as the full Monty is, you've got uh, 20th Century Fox distributing that. And uh, that's, that's marketing behind that that's probably three or four times the size of the budget. So crowdfunding a project like this for us, I think, is about allowing creative, like-minded people to contribute. And, uh, and I, I love them. I love looking at a lot of the other crowdfunders. I, I've contributed to quite a few over the last few years just because I love the idea or just because I love the passion with which the person is trying to get this film made or this book written, or this album produced. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's all about creativity for me at the end of the day. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, following on from all that. It's like the idea of this sort of creative economy where 
everyone, you know, would be quite happy to go to cinema to see a blockbuster, pay that ticket. And, you know, there's some cool blockbusters out there. But if you were to put aside, say, a set amount every month, every week, just to put back into these sort of independent films, or if it's just like just renting it on Amazon, that kind of thing, putting that money directly towards an independent project, you definitely see a much more diverse, interesting, creative landscape, just a lot more cool, weird things getting made. And, you know, you've got these, um, the big studios are getting more and more homogenized, like, you know, Disney buying 20th Century Fox, we've still not quite seen the ramifications of that. It's just becoming more and more, sorry, fewer and fewer voices deciding what gets made. And sort of, I think we've almost got an obligation to fight against that and keep films and other media as weird and wonderful as they can and should be. Yeah. Support anyone listening, support uh, indie film and support. Uh, sorry, what's your name? <laughs> the Meyer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I blanked. <laughs> Well, I'm blind. No. Yeah. Uh, no, Adam. You can find us on greenlit, uh, greenlit.com. Um, go on there, find the Maya, give us a little bit of money. Then go back to the homepage of Greenlit and find Love Without Walls, which is being made by my friend Jane, and chuck her a couple of quid as well, because that's going to be a corking film. Jane's a brilliant filmmaker. Okay. Um, but give some money to us first, please. Yeah, yeah, maybe you have to choose. Give most of your money to if us. You, if you have to choose between the two of us, I love Jane, but not that much. <laughs> Fair. Now, Adam, in your best menacing voice from earlier, can you just tell people when the the, the, the it ends, the crowdfunding ends? So the crowdfunding, it ends at the beginning of September. And that's the short period of time that you've got to donate. Or... I know a couple of lads with a white van and a couple of baseball bats that can come around and have a whip. Is that menacing enough for you? Yes. <laughs> I need to get away because I'm scared now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So Chris Watt, Adam Nelson, Tom Byrne, thank you guys for chatting with me on the Film Crazy Show. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank cool. you. Hey, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Again, there's a link below for the crowdfunding campaign, so if you'd like to see this fascinating cult film come to life, please consider helping out their campaign at greenlit.com. They'd really appreciate it, and so would I. Thank you again for watching my interviews, and enjoy the rest of your day or evening, whenever it is that you're listening to this.